Hello, my fellow friends, my fellow neighbors, and my fellow shining stars. Our next trolley stop is here. Our next trolley stop is now. Welcome back to another all new episode of the Empowered Publicity Children's Book Spotlight Series. To be precise, we have reached episode number 99. Cue that Prince song, especially for all those who graduated in 1999, like myself. My name is Jonathan Masalinas, the president here at Empowered Publicity. Thank you so much for spending some time with us wherever you are and wherever you may be. The countdown to the 100th episode of the Children's Book Spotlight series is almost complete. And yes, before number 100, there is number 99. We're going to be talking about something very special, something very unique and sort of a little bit out of the box. They say that, you know, life happens on the other side of your comfort zone. If you're familiar, of course, with the Children's Book Spotlight series, over the past 98 episodes, the majority of them have been focusing on children's picture books. We've talked about some middle grade books in between as well. But this week on the program, we are delving into the realm of YA. Now, those aren't just two letters of the alphabet. It's, it's kind of like Sesame Street. This episode of the Children's Book Spotlight series is brought to you by the letters Y and A. But of course, as our little ones grow older, they step into more mature books. They step into books that have a lot of adventure and discovery. And one of the most highly anticipated YA series of 2020 leading into the brand new year of 2021 is now available. We're gonna be sharing so much about the Libertalia series. And of course, one of the things about the Children's Book Spotlight series that we love to talk about is the specific message that is contained within each book. So we're not only gonna be talking about one book, we're not only gonna be talking about two books, we're gonna be talking about a trilogy. It's kind of like if you're a fan of Karate Kid, there was Karate Kid part one, Karate Kid part two, and Karate Kid part three. Well, leave it up to me. I always think that the second movies are better than the first. So that's the reason why I dove into the second, the second book of the Libertalia series before the first book. But well, where are my manners? The first book of the Libertalia series, Libertalia Lost Fortunes. The second book, Libertalia Quest for Land. And then the third book in the Libertalia trilogy, fittingly enough, The End of an Era. This week on the program, we are going to be talking about the theme of finding yourself and honoring your calling, which is very important, especially as we're stepping into this brand new year of 2021, many authors, entrepreneurs, people who are very much following their life's purpose right now, they're stepping into the most important steps of their path. So joining us is our featured guest. We head out. The trolley goes very far from San Diego. We're somehow going all the way to South Africa. Who says that you can't travel during this particular point in time? You can head on over to the official website of our featured guest, you can head on over to melinalewis.com. We've also included Mel's social media platforms in the description below for this wonderful interview that we are now about to begin. Joining us again all the way from South Africa, YA author, the creator of Libertalia series, Mel Lewis is joining us here on the program. Mel, we really appreciate your free time and joining us this week. How are things with you? Well, thank you. Thank you, Jonathan, so much for having me on your show. I, yeah, it's an honor and I'm super excited to be here with you chatting about the books. And yeah, it is quite crazy to be so far away, yet um, yeah, here we are, right? I am really excited to talk about your books. And when I first saw your, your, your series, and it's interesting because I like calling it a trilogy. Sometimes when you think of a series, the, time can, or the, the term can get lost in, in, in the shuffle a little bit. This was such a wonderful series of books for me to be able to read. You know that you're on to something as a reader when you open up the book and you can't put the books down. It's like, I need to finish this. So it's like, you know, you still have got your other, your other tasks to do, your other things throughout the course of the day. And there's the part of me, it's like, I just want to finish reading this book. 
for, for those of our listeners and viewers, our friends and neighbors and shining stars that are learning about you for the first time, that are learning about the Libertalia series, this is such, uh, these are fascinating books. So I, I figure there has to be some sort of backstory to leading into the creation of this. Could, could you take us back to the point in time or the points in time in your life where you knew you wanted to become an author and not just an author, and not just, you know, have, have it be geared specifically towards towards teens and tweens. When did you know that that point in time, when did you know that this was actually your purpose, that you wanted to be able to find yourself and honor your calling? <laughs> oh, yo, it's been a long journey. I um, I used to, my dad had a, one of those old typewriters, you know, that you'd like with the ribbon, and before we had a computer, sounds like I grew up in the dark ages, but um, <laughs> I remember those. I remember the type right? that long ago. <laughs> and um, and yeah, I kind of used to punch out because literally you punched out on those keys a story or two as a child. And I always loved English language at school, and kind of you know eventually kind of it gets. That, that love of writing and creating and word, and I always love to read, but I don't know, life happens and you end up doing like science at university. So it kind of got lost in, in the mix, this desire to actually write and to tell stories. And I think it came back in my, dare I say late thirties, I'm giving away my age. Um, and I sort of had this burning desire to write a story that I had been replaying in my mind, which was actually an adult book that I've written. And um, so that was actually my, my first novel, which um, is called After You Died. And then after that, I was kind of almost wondering, you know, like what now? And spoken with other authors and they've often said, oh, the second book, it's a thing. And I saw this competition for submitting a book written for kind of, you know, middle grade, young adult kind of age group. And I thought, oh, okay, I'll try my hand at that. And it was actually quite a, a tricky one because I thought, well, can I actually write that? And I, you know, they really wanted something that was quite representative in terms of South Africa because what you have is that kids seem to move from, uh, you know, a wide range of children's picture books and you've got so many options and a lot of authors often gravitate towards picture books. You know, um, if you think about Julia Donaldson and all those beautiful books and rhyming books and, you know, everyone loves the rhyming books. And so a lot of new South African authors have written within that and on such amazing, beautiful topics. But then that has then progressed um, or actually hasn't progressed into that kind of middle grade and older children. So you don't have authors writing from an African context um, into those age groups. And so this publishing company was obviously looking for, for that kind of content. And I realized that, yes, I saw it in my own children. Um, my son was about 11 at the time that he had moved straight on to, you know, from, from picture books into like, you know, Harry Potter and, you know, in terms of chapter books. And so he was reading about children in the UK or in the US. Um, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. You know, it's how you travel the world is through books, right? And, but there was nothing that was local or set in Africa or told African perspectives or stories. And so I was really interested in trying to create a fun, fictional adventure book that was set in Africa. So it did, you know, sometimes books in Africa tend to be very heavy. And I wanted to move away from that and just show that we can have fun and adventure. And so, yeah, it started that way. And, and while I was looking for that, I went to the gym for a bit of a jog. And uh, I was looking around trying to think, oh, how am I gonna crack this? How am I gonna crack this? And there was this guy that walked in, he had this like grizzly beard and these like big earrings in his ears. And I was like, oh my gosh, that guy looks like a modern day pirate. And it was like a light bulb in my head. And I was like, that's it, modern day pirates. 
what does that look like? And that led me down this whole path. I rushed home and I was like, just started researching like pirates, Africa, treasure. What, like, did we have, you know, what's the history? Is there stuff or is it like all just in the Caribbean? And I found stuff and yeah. And that's kind of where it started. And yeah, just rolled from there, I guess. And, and from there, something amazing was born. And, and this is where, again, there's, there, there's so much, this is kind of like, like a good problem that we had this week in the children's books about, like, there's, there's so much for us to be able to talk about. I think that the next ideal question is the creation of the series. Obviously, hmm. again, if, you know, let's say you're a children's book picture author, it's more finite. You know, there's anywhere from 20 to 40 pages there's multiple illustrations, there's a story, but you have a certain amount of space to be able mm. to share that story. Where if one loves to tell stories, and we'll talk about the importance of, st of storytelling, I'm sure in our, in our trolley stop here together today. I'm curious if you, could, if you could share with our listeners and viewers, our friends and neighbors and shining stars about the story itself. And then, walking us through the process of creating the three books because again this isn't just like hey i've got this great idea i want to talk about a modern day pirate kind of flush it out there's character development as well too so you wanted to make sure that you gave the the, the time for each character so before of course we talk about the four main characters in the book could you tell us a little bit more how after you did your research after everything began to come together how the libertalia series came to be as well as that term is just so it's almost like a mystical term libertalia if you could mm. kind of articulate a little bit about why why that title why libertalia okay so um i had an inkling of what libertalia was but i wasn't 100 percent sure and that led to a lot of research so libertalia is or rather Libertalia was a fabled town. So, and it was also fabled to be a free town. So a town where pirates could go and there would be no Navy. So uh, Southern Africa's waters were um, initially the Dutch were here and kind of ruled the waters and then the British came. And, and so the waters of around Southern Africa, you know, always had these colonial powers kind of vying for the space. And then obviously a lot of minerals and then slaves also being taken, you know, to, to Europe and, and other places. And so pirates kind of came with that. And they also had the stronghold, which was a town on Madagascar. And Madagascar is a beautiful um, island uh, just off Africa and this town was apparently where the pirates would go and they would no matter what ship they seized they would take the loot and then also the slaves and they would free the slaves on Madagascar and then you know I don't know drink rum and do all sorts of things whatever pirates do <laughs> and and so when I learned about this this amazing place I was like wow that's super exciting because it really means there really were pirates and then kind of I, I thought well I really want to name the book something interesting like an, a place and Libertalia sounded great because it's like liberty also you know freedom and right. so it really resounded with me and that's kind of where the name really came from and then I just you know I subtitled it just to give it a little bit of of context so like the first book is Lost Fortunes and you know the second one and so so yeah so that's that's where the the name for that came and I really wanted it to be about this this pirate stronghold that once existed the characters in the story and it, it, I, I again confession is that I jumped into book two before I jumped into book one, which is absolutely hilarious because like I'm, I'm, I'm learning about all of these characters. There, there's Isla, there's Carabo, there's William, and there's Unzi. We're gonna we're gonna go through 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 each one and the, the character development, the quirks in each. And I'm like, wait a minute, like these characters already know each other. Like, is that how the book is supposed to begin? And then here I am, like 75, 80 pages in. I'm like, did I just read book two before book one? 
but it, it made things a little easier for me. I'm just kind of reading through book and I'm like, yep, get it, understand it. Everything's starting to starting to go together. So by the way, just as an important footnote, make sure that again, when you enjoy the Libertalia trilogy, that you start off with Lost Fortunes first, followed by Quest for Land, followed by the end of an era, unless you want to go two, one, three in the fashion that that, that I did. Obviously, I, I, you know, each of the characters play an integral role. The you could call it if there's if there is the primary character. If you want to place a label on one of the characters and say who's the primary one, we would be talking about Carabo. Let's start off with her because, of course, the theme of this week's program is talking about finding yourself and honoring your calling. And she's very much been blessed with her own. We call them spiritual gifts. You know, she she sees visions and she's. She's, she's meant to do something very important, but she seems to be resisting a lot. And one of the things I can say from personal experience, and I'm sure that people who are moving forward in the most important steps on their path, when you, as the expression goes, what you resist persists. And when you came here to do something, whether it be, you know, write children's books, write YA books, whether it be a doctor, a nurse, a father, when you came here to do something, you got to be able to do it. So let's start off with Carabo. If you could talk to us mm -hmm. about, you know, what it was like to be able to create her, share her story, and really allow her journey to be able to unfold through all three of the books. Mm, absolutely. So I, I'll just kind of, just before I jump into her, I had wanted to include in the books something kind of magical. And, you know, like, as you'll know, with um, a lot of the kind of this age groups books, you know, like, so Harry Potter, there's actual, you know, wand magic. And, um, and then in, you know, in other books, there's a lot of books that are written around um, the gods that are now living on, on earth, you know, and, and so, and so I wanted to bring some kind of a different magic if you want to call it that but it's more kind of spiritual um and an element of the ethereal or something different something that you cannot see or touch of yeah and so and so hence i brought in the element of uh the sangoma which is a traditional or natural healer um and and so she was the one who i chose to <laughs> to go on this path and so Karaba was, she's so clear in my mind. She's this beautiful young girl who is very sporty and she's generally liked by everyone. She's academic. Um, all the kids at this particular school, it's a quite a snooty private school in the Eastern Cape in South Africa where there are actually a number of those types of schools anyway. So it's not that kind of far-fetched and um, and she is just a, a lovely all-rounder. And so when her ancestors call her, uh, and you could liken it to something like Mulan, you know, we've all watched Mulan and how her ancestors, she goes and speaks with her ancestors in a similar vein. So uh, when Karabo's ancestors call her to become a traditional heat, you know, what we call a Sangoma, she is like, she can't even believe it. She's like, no, but I just want to play hockey you know, and I think in America you call it field hockey. Um, and and so, you know, she wants to, she just wants to be a, like a really cool sports player and like pass her exams and go on holiday and do normal teenager stuff. And now she's must like deal with all this ancestral stuff. And she's like, no, 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 this is not <laughs> great. And so really the, the book and throughout the series, it's about her coming to terms with that and how to, bring that into her life because it is so much a part of her um she's also a young teenager and you know the part of growing in in being a teen is learning about who you are you know and and becoming your own person and and how you do that and how you experience that process so so yeah so that's Karabo's journey and I yeah I love her I, I do call the characters my my other children which I don't know if my kids like so much but um, <laughs> <laughs> I like they 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 are they are so real to me they like my four other children in my head so yeah. Sh shifting to William as well um, he's a 
he's a little bit difficult to be able to understand to a certain extent. He seems like he's he's got a lot that he wants to express, but there's a part of him that's closed off as well, you know, when it comes mm. to expressing his emotions and feeling his feelings. Um, he obviously has his own uh, checkered past, so to speak, but that necessarily isn't as, as the result of his own doing, so to speak, obviously. And we, we will, if you can kind of elaborate about his, his father and his bloodline without necessarily giving the full story away, he's definitely going through his own spiritual journey of sorts to be able to find out who he is and who he wants to become. Absolutely. So William is definitely, he's that classic, you know, bad boy, I suppose you could, you could lump him into, into that category and, you know, who doesn't, who doesn't love a slightly bad boy, but he is, he's a little bit messed up. He, um, he hasn't had the best parenting and he, he's left to his own devices and he often makes bad choices for himself and it's it's not great uh, but within him there is this tiny little spark and I think that's what Carabo sees and that's what I think she believes in and you know because her, her other friends just can't believe that she wastes her time with this guy and and she really, I think she sees through his kind of a hard outer shell, that bad boy facade that he's putting on and he's so cool and he's so macho and da da da. And, and she's, she can kind of see that there's, no, there's something good in this guy. And um, as the books move along, and I'll talk about in terms of as the series moves along, he kind of flits between good and bad and, you know, but, but, you see it in the end, and uh, slight spoiler, but I don't think too much, but but the good comes through in him. And it's it's kind of, you almost want to like fist pump in the air and go, yay, you know? Um, but yeah, he pulls through and, and that in the beginning books is kind of what she sees. And so even though we almost could not like him, you know, you'd kind of almost be as a parent like, oh, good grief, I wouldn't want my child to hang out with a boy like that um but but yeah there's something there's something good there and hang in there it turns before we talk about the the other two characters isla and imzy um it's there is this uh the the trilogy has some romance as well too and you know it's it's just like that that aww kind of like you know you know first love or you know teens you know uh, just you know developing relationships externally for the first time and it was just so sweet to be able to see this and again there's this um there's this heartfelt bond and connection even though it kind of goes through some twists and turns between Caribou and 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 William you can you can really tell how they how, how they care about each other even though it's not necessarily very super clear it can kind of be one-sided at different points in time along the way mm, yeah I mean I'm like oh, how can you be a teen and not have romance it's like oh you know like all those hormones but it's um it's very light romance just to assure parents there's there's nothing too onerous there. Um, but it's, yeah, you want to have that sense of like wonder and that like, oh, wow, you know, they're so interesting or that person is curious or, and then you get to know them and you're like, oh, no. And then you're like, oh, no, but they're interesting. Oh, no, but they're not. And that, <laughs> that confused Tell teenager. Like a like, yeah, but it's just, yeah. you, you know, you were as a, as a teen, you know, I, I can kind of look back on my own person and there were times where it, it's kind of like commitment, nah, commitment, you know, like, you know, back and forth. But again, it's, you know, really a journey of self-discovery. Uh, I love, when I think of Isla, I think of loyalty, especially with her friendship that she has with, with Caribo. Like, I, I'm asking, who wouldn't want to have a good friend, a rock in your corner, especially, you know, again, not to give away too many spoilers from the second book, but Isla lands up, you know, breaking, I believe, her arm or her arm and her wrist, if I'm not mistaken. So, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you, you know, uh, that happens to Caribou. So, so, so Isla is like her caretaker almost, you know, she's helping her, you know, take her food and, you know, make sure that she gets dressed when, you know, Caribou's kind of going through a little bit of a slump on her end of things. 
could, could and, and of course, you know, Isla has her own romance in the trilogy as well, too. You know, to, to be able to bring in that sort of, you know, I don't really want to pigeonhole it and label her as like the best friend in the story, so to speak, but what sign of quirks and characteristics for those, again, who are learning about the Libertalia trilogy, when, when they get to know Isla, what will they learn about her? Oh, Isla's, oh, she's just lovely. Uh, I'm like, <laughs> maybe I put all my like teen friend wants into Isla, I think, which is very selfish of me. But I just think she's, she is, she's your ultimate wingman. You know, she is that mate that will stand by you. She is fearless. She speaks her mind. She stands up for her friend and um, she knows what she wants. And, and her journey is very different to the others in that she also will learn how to be more of herself and find herself. And it's a tricky one for her because she, I think, feels as though she has to be someone within the role that she's created for her own self and for Z as well, who she adores. And and so it's it's very, very interesting in terms of how she goes forward. But but she is, she's totally Carabo's bestie. You can you can they they own that, that friendship. And um, she is also smart, dynamic, uh, very interesting, quirky, and uh, yeah, doesn't take any nonsense. So um, yeah, I really loved creating her and I found her quite funny as well. She very much speaks from, uh, speaks her mind. Sometimes she speaks from her mind more than she speaks from her heart, but you can kind yeah. of tell like there's points where there's that healthy balance where it's like heart and mind are connected. MZ. It, it, it's interesting because it's, again, with having multiple characters, you know, one might think, hey, I don't want to get MZ lost in the shuffle. And, he, you know, already going back into book one, like he, he plays a prominent role throughout the course of the trilogy. He's a dapper dresser. It's, you know, one of the things that I that I love by taking a look at the cover, it's, I'm like, can I get the name of his haberdasher? I think that's the <laughs> first time in 99 episodes of the, of the children's book Spotlight Series that I've mentioned the term haberdasher but again there is this this tapestry that's weaved between between all four of these all four of these characters could you share this a little bit more about mz and the journey that that he's on and his and really how this goes back to his family right so he is oh he's lovely so he's the head boy of the school and um, so that makes him very important he's also very sporty he is the captain of the rugby team so that would be like captain of the football team captain of the football team yep the varsity, <laughs> the varsity quarterback as we like to say yep <laughs> yes 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 the the guy on the team yep. and um and he he feels like he has to live up to all these roles because he is a smart sporty guy and it just comes quite naturally to him he is adored by his father but he does have to live up to all this stuff and there's a lot of pressure you know on a young guy and and i wanted to kind of toy with that and just kind of you know open up that that can of worms just for yeah just for people to see and in order to to live up to that you know he he must act a certain way and he must behave a certain way and so he kind of has to bury his emotions and so you know he it takes him a long time to to express himself especially you know to to girls and so he is constantly living this you know i've got to be this good guy kind of vibe mm -hmm. and yeah and it takes a while for him to 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 find himself and to also you know to see but he is also this lovely intuitive in that he also can see the good in William. Yes, so yeah. he he gives him a chance despite William's, ugh, you know, like offishness and his bad behavior and all of that, you know, he he does give him like a chance. So Mzee's just a lovely, lovely character. And he is special in the sense that he is the great, great, great grandson or maybe even I'll add in another great there for good measure. But um, I'm going to go back to the history books. But there was a king called Lobengula, which I'm sure is a mouthful. But Lobengula, he was a king of 
Zimbabwe. W w today is Zimbabwe. Um, and basically what happened was that um, Cecil John Rhodes, he was a British colonist and Br Cecil John Rhodes wanted to paint Africa red and his plan was to go from the Cape to Cairo and he was going to put it all under the Queen's name and this is true history he went into uh, modern day Zimbabwe and Lobengula tried to stop him and Cecil John Rhodes just mowed through you know with his army of redcoats and burnt down Lobengula's town completely mm. and Cecil John Rhodes had heard that Lobengula had treasure that he had elephant tusks so ivory he had gold and he had diamonds so the gold and the diamonds came from the mines if, you know if, all the way from the high felt in Johannesburg up into to Zim and and so there was this story that these treasures were hidden by Lobangula in some some way in Zimbabwe and Cecil John Rhodes wanted this and so he mowed down the town and burnt it to the ground and the story goes that at the end there was only this that all they ever found of this fabled treasure was this tiny little silver elephant, okay, that you could like put in the palm of your hand. And there was nothing else that they ever found. And it was the fable part is that the treasure was hidden, that Lobangula sent a bunch of men and they hid this treasure and then those men came back and then they killed them so that no one would ever know where the treasure was. So that's the, that's the story as it goes. Um, but in what I did was I took that story and I, created Lobangula's great 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 grandson which is Mzi and um, and he gets handed this little elephant I've made it gold because I think gold's nicer than silver um, and for my for my book and there's something very special about this little golden elephant so Mzi is a very special character in the book um, because he has this heritage and this connection to this possibility of treasure. I hope I didn't give anything away there. <laughs> oh, no. I think that the thing that we're, we're sharing a healthy amount without giving too much away, again, joining us as our featured guest here on episode number 99 of the Empowered Publicity Children's Book Spotlight Series, YA author, the creator of the Libertalia Trilogy, Mel Lewis is joining us. So you can head on over to her official website, of course, which is in the description below, melinalewis.com. We are sharing and diving into all three books of the Libertalia Trilogy, Libertalia Lost Fortunes, Libertalia Quest for Land, and Libertalia The End of an Era. Just to be able to uh, to put a, a nice bow for now on the characters we were talking about, there's also that heartfelt bond between Isla and Uzi as well. It's, you know, established the fact that, you know, that they were they, they were kind of a thing between William and, and, Car and Caribou. You kind of have to like, you know, there, there's a little in between the lines that you kind of have to be like, why isn't it crystal clear? You know, can't they just say how they feel about one another? And it seems that, you know, uh, th that Isla and Inzi were, were, it was a little bit clear, but, you know, they go through their own, through their own path. But, you know, you can tell there's a genuine affection, a genuine care for one another. What I am curious before we, we, we talk a little bit more about the book is, is that one of the things we love to do here on the Children's Book Spotlight Series is, is obviously whenever you're doing anything for the first time or even when you're doing anything even a second or third time when you are moving forth in your life's purpose and you're stepping into the next step the next step we can experience this is where the human element comes and we can experience challenges difficulties obstacles problems stressors troubles worries you name it and we need to get through to the other side of that right you know it can come in the form of fear or doubt resistance procrastination you've obviously birthed three books in this trilogy so this isn't just like wow all right i've, I've got this one book it's like oh I've got, I've got you know three books to be able to share uh, a, a large portion of those that that tune in are moving forth in their life's purpose whether it be children's authors children's illustrators uh, entrepreneurs whatever the case might be what were some of the challenges and the difficulties that you experienced in the creation and the writing of the Libertalia trilogy? And what were some of the things that helped you through that to get through to the other side so that all three of these books could come to be? Sure. Um, so 
it's it's tricky you know writing is very much about showing up and um and it's about putting those words onto paper or onto your computer um and and just doing a little bit every day if you can um i i try and write a little bit if i'm working on a piece i try and write um you know uh for an hour or so minimum every day. Uh, I have a day job, so I kind of squeeze that in either early in the morning or late at night or in and around children. So so it the, the challenge is always finding the time. You kind of have to make it, you have to carve it into your day. That it's usually uh, when you would be sleeping. <laughs> that's when you're writing. So, so yeah, so, so that's the, the tricky thing and um, other challenges are I suppose a, a different you know kind of engaging with parents and and showcasing the book to parents and telling them about the story with an adult book it's very easy or it's easier um, you know to to kind of just say oh I've got this book here read it kind of thing whereas mm -hmm. you know parents are selective with what they put in front of their children as they should be and it's um, so that was also a challenge. But in terms of the actual writing, um, yeah, sometimes you just kind of don't want to, and that's with the day that you've got to push through. And I, um, there's a fantastic book uh, by Stephen Pressfield, the um, the War of Art. It's a small little book, and it's amazing. And it's it talks around um, resistance, and and resistance is very powerful. It's the trick your mind plays on you. And for me, it like yeah, it shows up every now and then. And it's about pushing through that. And that's kind of when you get to to the other side and you break through or, you know, yeah. So um, it is, it's just, it's it's time and effort and, and hard work and bum on seat, really. So, yeah. I think this is a perfect segue into our next question. Of course, again, the the heart of our conversation, so to speak, of episode number 99 of the Empowered Publicity Children's Book Spotlight series is finding yourself and honoring your calling. <clears throat> and it's interesting because like, it, it, I, I, I kind of laugh as I clear my throat because, you know, when we clear our throat, we're kind of moving through any sort of fear resistance that I may have. And I mean, I'll be the first to admit in raising my hand, it's like, you know, as I've shared with you, like, you know, I recently moved couple of months ago from Buffalo across the country to San Diego, California to take the next steps in my work for the children out here. And my plans include, you know, releasing my own children's books as well as, you know, opening up the children's hospice for terminally ill children. And it's just like, you know, after my grandmother passed away a little over seven years ago, she made it increasingly clear to me and it wasn't from a judgmental perspective it's like listen you know what you came here to do you know your work is for the children right so you know just speaking from my own experience being able to you know connect with my own higher self being able to be more clear more present more focused uh less scattered calling in for more clarity for more consistency to be connected with the flow I may have given away maybe some of the answers to the next question that I have, but obviously I want to get your thoughts. For those of our friends and neighbors and shining stars, for those of our listeners and viewers who are tuning in, this could seem like a million dollar question. How can we find ourselves and honor our calling? And it's interesting because as I'm asking that question, I think it's not even necessarily a matter of finding yourself. I think it's more a matter of either rediscovering yourself or maybe even more so remembering who you are. Could you mm. share a little bit more about that when it comes to finding yourself and honoring your calling, what you'd be able to share with our listeners and viewers and our friends and neighbors so mm. that they can move forth in their most important steps on the path that they chose to walk? Yeah. No, um, <laughs> it's a lot of self-work. Um, you know, I truly believe in, you know, and my husband likes to mock me and he's like, oh, reading a self-help book again. Um, <laughs> 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 I'm like, oh, come on. Um, so, 
self work is really where it starts um in trying that and you know i went on and i still am on a um i do a lot of yoga so and the philosophy of yoga um, has helped me a lot in terms of understanding um oneself in relation to the ego and how the truth and the ego relate and and yeah i you know i don't want to kind of take us down a whole rabbit hole here but but very much around kind of trying to understand yourself in order to be a, a better a better version of yourself and for me having children um made me really sit up and have a look at myself and and who i wanted to be as an example for my kids so that i could be a better mother and mm. and that was really the catalyst you know my son's 12 so yeah motherhood was was a shock to the system and and the best thing that that I could have done and not to say that you couldn't go on a journey without kind of doing that um but it is that thing of really checking in and noticing who you are and and is that is that it you know and then in terms of really opening up to your truth and your flow it's very much often a case of stepping around oneself you know so this visage that we put on in the world and how we show up um a lot of the time there's you know what's kind of sitting behind that and mm -hmm. when you're in a creative process sure you need to physically show up but you almost need to kind of of that mask and just allow you know the story to flow without judgment without your teacher's voice your mother's voice your father's voice you know that little we often call it um a this like like a room of judgmental little voices sitting there chirping and and giving their opinion on how you should be living and how you should be doing and 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 kind of letting that all go and just finding the peace and quiet inside of yourself and then just writing whatever you write you know and then once you've actually got something on paper then you can totally critique it you know i work with an editor i work with um a lot of people i, I surround myself by people who are i want to almost say like better writers in the sense that they work with me to help my story become refined and better than I could do it on my own because the story comes through me and I produce it but you know when we sit down and turn it into a sellable product that's when you kind of switch on your business brain and you can put your mask back on and you can like make this into a thing but if you don't give yourself the opportunity and the space to just create and tell a story from your heart or you know and and kind of almost kind of give yourself a frontal lobotomy you like like don't think don't <laughs> overthink it just write and create and that way then you then you can and you can just free flow it and then when you done then you sit and you nitpick it and you change it and you fix it and you edit it and you give it to other people and yeah absolutely that's a business process but the writing process should be unhindered unhinged yeah that's, I, it, that's my opinion it's it's interesting how you mention you know when we look back on 2020 uh well the one of the words we'll think of unfortunately is masks but it's interesting i feel how that is a representation of how many of us just walked around wearing these masks for years mm -hmm. we were trying to prop ourselves up into someone or someone that we wanted to be right and when we're wearing our mask we're muffling our truth so to speak so as we enter into 2021 and for those who are watching episode number 99 of the children's book spotlight series we're on the other end of the pandemic hooray we're not wearing masks anymore no more social distancing this is great we're all hugging and loving on each other it's fantastic right uh, but i i i feel that you know it's we're we're, we're literally setting the trajectory for the coming new year because it really is a matter of more and more people now are remembering who they are and it's just no bones about it like again you know when i made the decision to come out here to san diego i said i know who i am i know what i'm here to do it's a matter of i came here to do it 
we all have the same currency. We all have 24 hours in a day. We all have seven days in a week. We all have 365 days in a year, except during leap years when there's that 366th day. How are you going to use <laughs> your time? So, you know, Mel and I encourage all of you, our listeners and viewers here on the Children's Book Spotlight Series, like if you have a calling, if you have a burning desire in front of you, right, that, that that's within your heart, something that you want to be able to fulfill, even if it's just taking those baby steps at first, taking that hour a day for your writing, whatever that necessarily looks like, even if it's something is just like, I want to get into better shape for the new year, or I want to quit smoking, or I want to stop drinking take that small step each and every day. Here we are, we're, we're, we're kind of transforming from a children's book spotlight series episode into like a self-help, you know, a, a, a self-help audio book, so to speak, with videos. Again, we are winding down our time with YA author and the creator of the Libertalia Trilogy. Mel Lewis is joining us, of course. We are sharing the Libertalia Trilogy to its completion. Book one, Libertalia Lost Fortunes, book two quest for land and book three the end of an era they are now all available on amazon by the way you can purchase your copy where are my manners you might be asking how can i purchase these books jonathan in the description below very simple is where you can actually purchase your books on amazon in the process um one of the things that, that i wanted to mention actually a couple things before we begin to wind down our time is is that um the the connection that will has with his father and I think mm -hmm. that, you know, many of us can kind of empathize with that a little bit, because I think that what these past several years have been about is disconnecting from, uh, if we feel guided to do so, if we want to blaze our own trail, disconnecting from that old disconnect, disconnecting from the familial bloodline, stepping into our truest and our highest self, so to speak again, without giving too much away, so to speak, could you talk a little bit about the dynamic that, that William has with his, you know, not just with his, with his father, but also with, with his mother and how that really, you know, shaped him to, in, shaped him into who he was, but more importantly, who he was destined to become. Hmm. Oh, oh, that's a goodie. So William, yes, he, so for a lot of book one, yeah, we mustn't mustn't give too much away about about his mom. But um, in the first book, we really find that William's father is, and his name is Edward, is not a nice man by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, he and I, that's what I, my illustrator captured him. It was like she had cracked open my skull and like, created him on the page. I don't know how she did it, but he made him perfectly in how I saw him. You know, this huge, big hulk of a man, like terrifying. If you've ever met those people that you walk into a room and they're like full up tons of space, he's that guy. He is, you enter the room with him and he's terrifying. He's a cruel man. He is cruel to his children and he's yeah he's awful and will is you know he's he's confused he doesn't know how to you know this is his father it that's all he knows he doesn't know other parental relationships um his mother hasn't been around most of his life and so so it's very difficult for him to understand what love is like and his growing friendship with Carabo and Isla and MZ is the thing that I think starts to alert him to another kind of relationship and that love doesn't look like hurting you. And I think that's, that's kind of a, a, a turning point for him. He hasn't really had real friendships, you know. He's always been the bad kid throwing parties and, you know, people flock to him because he's, you know, got free stuff to give away and, you know, great party and, and all of that kind of thing. But mm -hmm. but these other kids are now showing him, hmm, and he's like, wait a minute, okay, yeah, no, there's something funny here, like with his relationship with his father, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense anymore. It's, no. He's normally just accepted it 
but now he's starting to see that wait a second no no this is not cool you don't treat people like that and and so so that's where it kind of starts to he starts to break away from that that father of his because he sees that that's not who he wants to be and i think it's that that thing and it happens very much kind of as a teen where you kind of look at your parents as from the perspective of an adult and less from a child and he's going through that and obviously because he's a little bit you know ahead in terms of the freedom he's been given as a youngster he yeah so so yeah so that would be that and then i don't know if we should talk about his mom but that relationship is is very beautiful it's completely opposite to his dad and um and she really wants to be with him and when that relationship starts to bloom i think the realization of who his father is and how he's treated him all his life is he can't he can't put his rose tinted glasses on when he looks at his father anymore he really starts to see him for who he is so yeah it's an interesting one there is there is again, we we could just devote like a full episode just to talking about the characters their quirks their mannerisms <laughs> their their relationships so we're going to give you the morsels that we can give you here on episode number 99 of the children's book spotlight series i think a, a perfect question to be able to ask is is that you know for and we talked about this in our green room is that you know for those parents and even educators that are tuning in and and, and they love sharing children's books with their little ones slash students, eventually they get to the point where they put down the picture books and they're picking up, you know, for, for me, you know, growing up, it was the Hardy Boys, it was the Boxcar Children, I had to put down the Berenstein Bears books and kind of, you know, graduate to another level of, of books, so to speak. What are some, what are some tips? What are some suggestions, things that you like to share from your heart to be able to help parents that are, you know, that have children that are stepping into that tween teen age and they're putting down the one book, they're, they're beginning to step into the other. How can, how can parents and educators begin to prepare their little ones and their students to be able to step into the realm of middle grade books, young adult books, to step into that, their own next level of their own learning and growth and development when it comes to the love and joy of reading? Hmm. Look, I'll, um, I'm certainly no expert, but I'll kind of go with my experience. And sure. for me, it's very much, you know, allowing children to, to show their interest. So, you know, often as a parent, it's very easy to go, oh, this is a beautiful book, let's read this. But as they get older, they have certain preferences. Um, so uh, using my own children, my son loves like hardcore adventure. So like Alex Ryder and, you know, he read the first one and then that's it for him. He's that classic, you know, it's got to be hardcore adventure. There's kids running, shooting, flying, jumping from page one right up until page 200. And, but that's his personality. So that may be not be what I enjoy, but the important thing there is to kind of try and find and help your child find the genre that they love mm -hmm. um you know even though it may not be your thing and and so it's kind of sitting with them in the library and going okay well these are this kind of book um do you want to try one of these or and this is that kind of book should we should we take one of those and try it out and you can read maybe like the first couple of pages or i have friends who are fantastic their kids read like books by the dozen but every night they'll read like one or two pages in bed with with the kids and i think that that taking the time to read with your kid and connect and understand what they're reading and showing interest in that makes a makes a huge difference and um so whereas my daughter is not a keen reader i'm blush and um and she but if she does read something it's usually dark and like murder mystery. She's quite quirky and she's the younger of the two. And so, you know, so, but that's her, her interest, you know, that's what like lights her up. And so for me, it's very much, I think, working with this evolving little personality that is now leaving these baby books and wanting to get into chapter books and, and finding kind of, you know, where that goes. 
the other recommendation I would think is to a lot of reading books together. So as a family, we read Harry Potter all books together um, and I would make us read the whole book before they were allowed to watch the movie and um, and so that has been great so audiobooks are wonderful also um, you know in the car and finding what works for you as a family sometimes you know as they get older the audiobooks um, are trickier because not everyone likes the same thing um, so so yeah so there's a lot of ways just to kind of evolve it but it needs to be in line with your child because once they connect with a genre that they like then they just fly but if you're forcing fantasy down a child's throat who actually just likes more kind of Enid Blyton type stuff you it's just you know it's not going to work so so very much I think it's about listening and trying to understand your child and who they are and what they what they like and then you're know, sifting through stuff in the library some sometimes you win sometimes you lose um in terms of genres but yeah, that would be my my recommendation. When when I first saw the title of your trilogy, Libertalia, it kind of brought me back to the term Shangri-La. Everyone wants yeah. to have their own Shangri-La. This own almost like this this heaven on earth sort of space that they can be in as much as possible. How can we create our own heaven on earth kind of thing? That's not the question that I'm about to ask, but it's interesting because the question <laughs> that came to mind is how can we create our own libertalia we can kind of now begin to look in the rear view mirror of what was 2020 and we're like oh we're not we, we're we're learning that we don't want to create what we created before because it led to pain and destruction and chaos and stress and anxiety within ourselves and collectively so to speak so i feel that many of us right now are either creating our own libertalia our own Shangri-La, so to speak, I'm trying comparing the terms, so to speak, to have an idea of my question. How do you feel that we can help our children and our teens, since we're of course talking about the, the teens and tweens here on this particular sort of the children's book spotlight series, how can we as parents and caregivers and custodians of our children help them to create their own libertalia, their own Shangri-La, so to speak? Hmm. Yo, that's that's quite a tough question. I think um, a lot of it is to do with listening. Um, kids say things in certain ways that you know we kind of brush off, or as parents, you don't want to you don't want to hear it because then it means maybe a little bit extra work. Or and I think in this time where a lot of us have been stuck at home trying to work and then trying to homeschool if, you, if that's what you can call it um, and trying to manage everything you can't and I think it's important to maybe set aside time and maybe it's just at the end of the day when you go and you sit on your kid's bed and you really really listen to what they are saying mm. and kind of just that's when kind of you know, things come out. Um, I've also heard from a lot of other parents, you know, getting in the car. Um, you know, if you have a car here in South Africa, a lot of us have to have cars because everything's quite far apart. And, you know, getting in the car and kids in the back and not having that direct eyesight and just asking some questions. And often a, a conversation ensues and that often i think helps for me um very lucky to live in cape town and so there's beaches and things and nature and mountains i'm sure the same in california where you are and it's important to be out in nature i think and you know pack a little backpack and go for a walk and even a grouchy irritated teenager can't resist the magic of nature and fresh air and will even if they slouch their way up a hill and hate you at the top they will still love the experience and there will be that shift especially with kids being stuck in front of screens for school and then in front of right. screen entertainment in front of screens to speak to their friends it's horrible and um you need to kind of turn those things off and go outside 
and and really kind of spend some I hate the term quality time but time with family you know outdoors is is definitely the best especially if you're doing something active or swim in the ocean or a snorkel or whatever it is so so yeah so I think those are some things that that could help but it's really it is it is putting that time aside you know and I know we've all as parents got deadlines but I feel that just just to briefly add on one of the things that come to mind is the importance of being in the moment because Mm -hmm. there's 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 times where you know you might find yourself at a grocery store and you hear a beautiful song come to mind I know that one of the moments it's etched in my mind when I lived back in Buffalo I was at Trader Joe's which is one of the popular grocery stores here in the United States and the Belinda Carlisle song from the 80s. I think it was late late 80s, Heaven is a Place on Earth comes to mind. And, and that's, that's, that, that's one of those go-to songs. Right? And it's just like being in the moment that song comes on. It's like, that was a heaven on earth moment. That was a Shangri-La moment. That was a Libertalia moment for myself, right? So I think it's just a matter of being in the moment, right? With many of us, you know, especially our, us as adults, we were programmed to push the fast forward button. Like many of us, throughout the pandemic, throughout 2020, we just said we want to get through to 2021 and pretend like 2020 didn't happen, but there's always lessons and blessings and miracles that are happening. There's always silver linings amid any sort of dark cloud, not to sound like a self-help book when I say that. And (laughs) it's so important to just be in that moment and just enjoying every single experience. Looking back Mm -hmm. on 98 past episodes of the children's book, Spotlight Surgeons, and as we approach episode 100, which will be previewing momentarily before we conclude this week's program, I always love to ask my guests on the program, and this particular instance, it's a little bit different because I always ask those that, that join me, authors or illustrators, what their book taught them about themselves and taught them about life. Well, you have three books and four primary characters, so to speak. So Mm -hmm. I'm curious if you could articulate and share from your heart on what creating, writing, sharing this series, all three books, the Libertalia trilogy, what this experience, all parts of it, taught you about yourself and it taught you about life, as well as if you can maybe just like one little thing that like okay Isla taught me this about myself and life and William taught me this and and uh and and Imzi taught me this and you know Carabo taught me this if you could kind of share maybe like you know one specific thing that each character taught you about yourself and life as well too if you could sure so I think the the series as a whole reminded me that I am young at heart and it's you you'll probably be like uh, okay yeah i heard that before you know but but really and truly like that feeling of being young it's like reignited that inside me i had a friend purchase the books for um another friend's daughter and she said oh can i put you in touch she wants to chat to you and this young girl was 13 and so she whatsapp me and then we chatted and she said wow you really get being 13 and i was like <laughs> <laughs> i was i was so it's actually the best compliment i've ever had, that, yeah. I've had <laughs> i was yeah. like yeah i know i get being 13 and and that was that was great because i was like oh yeah cool i can still connect i can still connect to that 13 year old inside and see how she feels and so the the books ignited that mostly um across each one for me in terms of each character i think karabo taught me to be brave um, mm. i find her so brave i i uh, think she is amazing in every way she uh, is able to be you know good at her her schoolwork amazing at her sports um a dedicated friend and then to enter into this ancestral spiritual realm and take it on and i think whew, wow she's brave so she taught me about bravery and then i think isla isla taught me about true friendship and 
and and lightness and love and um, joy in friendship. And so I am grateful to her for that. And then William taught me about um, that there is, yeah, he's, he is the element of the silver lining uh, in that dark cloud and that he, he comes around and he is, there's something magical and special about him, but, but still something a little bit dark. And I quite, I quite like that about him. So for me, he reignited my interest in people who don't always reveal everything and um but they're still good people so that's what that's what he showed me and then mzi he epitomizes um young black men for me that i see every day who are just amazing uh you know we have a lot of violence unfortunately in south africa and and men are unfortunately a lot of the cause and but i find it quite difficult that you know men as a whole are painted with this brush and um all the good guys um are forgotten in a sense and for me z is that lacquer oh that's a very south african word he's that very nice very awesome <laughs> uh south african guy and uh and he is what i hope more young south african men will be like and um so yeah so he's He's my hope, really. A lot of great messages right there. Uh, as a little tip of the cap to one of our favorite neighbors, Mr. Rogers. I'm not sure how big Mr. Rogers from Mr. Rogers' neighborhood was out in, in South Africa. Many people know of, you know, Tom Hanks because he played Mr. Hey. Rogers in the film, A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood. So, you know, most people that maybe weren't necessarily introduced to Mr. Rogers, uh, you know, remember him through Tom Hanks. He kind of, you know, uh, uh, you know, stepped into his, uh, stepped into his, stepped into his life. He's been a big influence in our work here at Empowered Felicity. And one of the things that he reminded us when he won his Lifetime Achievement Award at the Daytime Emmys a few years before he passed, he always would keep the time. And he did this when he spoke at several commencement speeches at colleges or different talks that he did across the country here in the U.S. He would ask the question, and he was really more of a declarative statement, I should say, to remember those who help love you into being. So those people that mm, would take the time to be there for you and maybe you weren't you weren't there fully for yourself or maybe someone that saw that spark of creativity, that spark of divinity within you that you didn't see it within yourself. You've done tremendous work with this, with this trilogy, Mel. So I, I, I would like to see if you'd be kind to share with our listeners and viewers in our closing moments to share just some of those, some of those kind hearts and those beautiful souls that help love you, Mel Lewis. And yeah. Oh, well, yeah, definitely um, my family. So my husband, even though I said that, you know, he, he laughs at my self-help book addiction. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm laughing at that too. <laughs> it is, it's a problem. Um, so he's, he's my rock. You know, he just, he just is. I'm very lucky to have him. Um, and then my kids, well, more my son. My daughter's less interested. Um, he likes to read, he likes to read the books and check them. And then he likes to give me little comments as well. It's very entertaining. Uh, but there are so many people, um, you know, my friends, like, who show up at book launches. You know, they just show up. Maybe their kids are too young or... Maybe they don't feel like coming on a Saturday morning to some bookstore, but they show up. Mm. And yeah, I, I can't mm. be grateful enough. Um, um, and then the, the other thing is, uh, and they don't know that they are so important to me, but I've shared my book with an NGO called Funza here in South Africa, and it they take the book and they kind of cut it up into smaller pieces and then it's um, made more easily readable on mobile, so on cell phones. And um, then children in the townships, in the poorer areas can access the stories and the kids then leave comments underneath the, what they think about the books. And these are children who 
don't know me from a bar of soap, you know, so there's like, they, <laughs> like they, don't have, the they don't have to be nice. They're not my friend's children who go, yes, it's very nice, Auntie Mel. Um, you know, these are kids who don't know me. And they leave the nicest things and they're like, oh, I love the story and this character really resounded with me. And, and that, like, to me, those are superheroes. And, mm -hmm. uh, and they, they really, yeah, they really make my day. Um, but yeah, friends and family who kind of, oh, even if they do or don't read, but they kind of just like, congrats, well done, pat you on the back, just keep going. Those, those little things, people don't even realize how important they are in kind of keeping you on your path. So yeah, be nice is my thing. Like, be nice to other people, it's not so hard. Thank you for sharing that. And it's interesting because things come full circle. You know, we spend time today on the special trolley stuff. Episode number 99 of the Children's Book Spotlight Series talking about finding yourself and honoring your calling. And I feel that a large important part of that is to be able to allow your heartfelt wishes to come to form and shape. So one of the things that we also love doing here at the Children's Book Spotlight Series, we have a little segment that's entitled Three Wishes. So I am a, I'm a huge uh, Disney fan on my end of things and specifically people might ask me, well, Jonathan, what's your go-to? And I'll always go back to 1992, Robin Williams playing Aladdin, the genie of the lamp. And of course it was rechristened yes. with Will Smith. He did the live action remake of Aladdin. But, you know, it, 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 you know, Disney, they put out all this sort of merchandise because of course they have to capitalize off those Disney films. So <laughs> when the movie came out, I actually found this genie lamp and just my entire life, I'm like, wouldn't it be just cool to have a genie lamp? Just like, you know, you can rub the lamp and get your three wishes kind of thing. So I do feel that all of us, you know, with as part of our own gifts that we have, we help others bring to form and shape their heartfelt wishes and desires. So Maligan, you have given to uh, children, tweens, teens in South Africa, around the world through the Libertalia trilogy. You've given so much to your husband to your family so now you're being given three wishes now these three wishes they can be for yourself they can be for your son they can be for the children of the world some people on the program they wish for world peace some people will wish for something you know the, the, the only disqualifier is is that you can't you can't uh you can't use one of your wishes to get more wishes that's like one of, i think that's the only disqualifier and then i think as robin Williams said like you can't make someone like you know, uh, uh, Aladdin wanted, you know, he wanted Jasmine to fall in love with her and like he couldn't do that like it had to happen organically. So those are the only two disqualifiers, but what would those three wishes be for yourself now? Well, wait, before we get there, I have to say to you, there was another one that was a disqualifier because, uh, spoiler, I'm also a Disney fan. Um, so um, you can not make people come back from the dead. I don't know if you yes. remember, then you go, yes, yes, like yes. That. yes. <laughs> Um, qualifiers. <laughs> you know, those out of the way. Go ahead. Um, so I, my first wish would be oh, for people. It's going to be weird. I'm not too sure how to put it, but for people to not be so anxious and terrified of COVID, um, I wish people more peace and serenity and yeah, to let to not become fixated and so anxious and then medicated um so yeah that would be my first wish um my second wish would be for hmm so tricky can i like eradicate poverty <laughs> is that a, is that allowed that is, that is quite powerful and wishes can happen so that that's a ending <laughs> poverty i'll put that out there I'd, I, that would be quite nice it would help africa a lot um so um if we could if we could have that and um my third wish so here in south africa at the moment we have um from the 1st of December, we have something called 16 Days of Activism, uh, which is around um, raising awareness around the abuse of women and children. And it's a huge, 
huge thing here and I would wish for no more abuse of women and children. So yeah, those would be my three. Those are three magical wishes for putting those out there with you. This has been such a fantastic interview. It's a little longer than our normal interviews, but of course, you know, we've got three books that we were talking about. So again, the Libertalia Trilogy, it is now available. We encourage you to head on over to Mel's official website, melinalewis.com, which is again, in the description below. You can head on over to Amazon. You don't even necessarily have to head on over to Amazon. You can just click the link in the description below and purchase your copies of the Libertalia Trilogy. Again, you can go down the route of reading book two before book one. It's kind of like watching Karate Kid Part Two, which is the better <laughs> one versus Karate Kid Part One, by the way. But again, Lost Fortunes, Quest for Land. And again, I, I love the title of the third book, The End of an Air. It really shows the finality, the conclusion of things, so to speak. Now, we are super excited because next trolley stop will be episode number <clears throat> excuse me episode number 100 of the children's book spotlighters and we've been we've wanted to share something special with all of you our listeners and viewers our friends our neighbors our fellow shining stars those of you who have been with us since day one since episode one of this program this this magic carpet ride there's another disney reference that began a little over two years ago. And something very special will be shown your way the next episode. And we can actually officially share that because we wanted to make sure we had the I's dotted and the T's crossed. <clears throat> but one of the most beloved and popular children's illustrators and authors in the world is gracious enough to spend some of his free time with us leading into Christmas and leading into the beginning of the new year. We're going to be sharing all of his incredible work, and he's going to be helping us connect the dots. And isn't that fitting as we approach the end of the year? It's like, it's, you know, it's kind of like putting the final pieces of a jigsaw puzzle together. The dots will be connected next week for episode number 100 of the Empowered Publicity Children's Book Spotlight Series. His two brand new releases, the first one, which is entitled Be You, courtesy of our friends and neighbors at Orchard Books, which is, of course, through Scholastic. And, of course, you've seen his work as well, <clears throat> excuse me, being the illustrator of the New York Times best-selling I Am series with Susan Verde, the latest release in the series, I Am One, A Book of Action, New York Times best-selling illustrator and author Peter Reynolds is going to be joining us next week on the program. So, we're super excited to be able to connect with Peter. We're gonna be sharing so many wonderful messages. And of course, he's gonna be helping us connect the dots in the process. We're gonna be sharing the importance of being yourself. We're gonna be talking about how beautiful things just start with one. We start off the children's book spotlight series. We had a heartfelt intention to be able to help children's authors and middle grade authors and YA authors share their inspiring stories and the release of their brand new children's books and to be able to help children all across the country and all around the world connect with their favorite authors and illustrators. Started off with one, one episode, and we reach episode number 100, which again will be released next week, the week of December 14th. So again, you know how to stay connected with us here at Empowered Publicity feel free if this message has helped you if it has inspired you if it's brought healing into your heart if you can say you know what jonathan now is the result of this special trolley stop with mel lewis i have not only found myself because you were never lost to begin with right and now i'm choosing to honor my calling we encourage you to subscribe to empower publicity's official youtube channel youtube.com empowered publicity if you already haven't had the chance to do so and to be able to share episode number 99 of the Children's Book Spotlight series with those that you feel guided to do so or on your favorite social media platforms of choice, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn. We really appreciate the continued support in the process. If you are a children's author, if you are a children's illustrator and you would like to be able to share your inspiring story and the release of your brand new children's book, 
in the brand new year. Say it with me now. Say it loud and say it proud of 2021. If you would like to appear on the Empowered Publicity Children's Book Spotlight Series and join the Empowered Publicity family here, us, PR from the heart, you can connect with us via our official website at empoweredpublicity.com or reach out to us on any of our social media platforms, Facebook and Instagram at Empowered Publicity and Twitter at Empowered underscore PR. If you are a children's author, a children's illustrator, and you would like for us to be able to share your brand new, your brand new children's book on the Empowered Publicity Storytime with Mr. Jonathan, you know where to connect with us, you know how to reach us. If you are a children's author, if you are a children's illustrator or an inspirational or spiritual author, and you would like to learn more information about how we at Empowered Publicity can be of service to you, if you would like to create your own virtual media tour, if you would like to create your own book media tour in a city of your choosing, or if you would like to learn more information about our media coaching and mentoring program, you can schedule your courtesy discovery call at empoweredpublicity.com. And again, let us see how we can be of service to you in this brand new year of 2021 to help your dreams take flight and to help you honor your calling. Once again, one final time, the Libertalia Trilogy is now available. Libertalia Lost Fortunes, book one in the Libertalia Trilogy, book two, again, Quest for Land. Again, this is the book that I started first, by the way. And book three, The End of an Era, it is now available. You can head on over to melinalewis.com you can also head on over to Amazon.com again, both in the description below. You can order your copies of all three books if you feel guided to do so. And once again, feel free to leave a five-star review for not only one book, but all three if you feel guided to do so, because that is one of the many ways that you can support Mel and all of the amazing children's authors, middle grade authors, YA authors that are doing wonderful work for children, queens, and teens all across the country and all around the world. Let us not forget the message of one of our favorite neighbors, Mr. Rogers. He reminds us, and we're reminding all of you, that you are perfect, you are whole, you are healthy, you are complete, you are loved, you are special, just the way that you are, that I like you just the way that you are. And of course, let us not forget our favorite series of numbers here at the Children's Book Spotlight, series 243. There's two letters in love, I should say two letters in we, four letters in love, and three letters in you. And thanks to for, to Mel for joining us this week. So we're reminding you that we love you. To all of you, thank you for your continued support of the Empowered Publicity Children's Book Spotlight Series over these past 99 trolley stops together. Thank you for your support of children's authors and children's illustrators all around the world. And most importantly, thank you for helping us to walk home the children of the world. So again, we hope that you enjoy this special and magical trolley stop. This has been episode number 99 of the Empowered Publicity Children's Book Spotlight Series. From Mel Lewis, from myself, Jonathan Masalinas, we will see all of you next week on episode number 100 of the Children's Book Spotlight Series. It's going to be such a fun time. Be sure to join us. Be sure to tell your friends, your neighbors. It's going to be a very festive occasion. Again, thank you for helping us to walk home children, the world.